morning. Good morning. I'm going to get quite personal with, uh, with you. Um, because normally as a, as a founder, you like to share success stories. When people ask, how are you doing? You like to say, we're crushing it. Um, so uh, you don't get to share the, uh, you know, the, the actual struggles or the, the issues that you're facing until you're with, with friends uh, one-on-one. So I'm going to need all of you to become my friends in the next, let's say, five seconds um, so that I can actually share these stories with you. So let's, uh, let's agree to be friends, okay? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Dan Vedderpool. I'm the, I'm the founder of... Whoops, that went quick. I'm the founder of Peerbee, uh, a website that enables people to borrow and rent the things they need from others in their neighborhood. And I'd like to talk to you about some struggles today. Um, because as a, the entrepreneur, as the founder of a sharing platform, I'm faced with a lot of struggles every day. Uh, it seems that there are only two directions that you can, can go in. It's, uh, it's either you become this big uh, VC-funded company that is making a lot of money, you're super successful and you, and you rule the world, um, or you're uh, an activist and you, uh, you're looking for, uh, to improve workers' rights, you want everybody to be involved in the, in the platform, build a community, and, uh, um, and, and it's kind of this, uh, this utopian uh, vision. Um, but, um, yeah, in, in, in reality, it's, uh, I'm afraid it's not as simple as that. There's, there's probably something in the middle, something, something that, as a founder, you have to, uh, have to discover. So today, I want to, basically, I want to I wanna ask the question, is it really possible to build this utopian vision of the sharing economy, this romantic vision that we have um, of creating a better world, or is the sharing economy just... Uh, you know, what it is in its bare essence, a, a more efficient way to access resources. But before I do that, a little bit about myself. Um, I founded the company in 2011, and I was inspired by an event in 2009. In 2009, my house burned down uh, with all my belongings. And in the weeks that followed, I was, I was forced to share. I, uh, I had to sleep with, uh, with friends, I had to borrow things from, from neighbors, and I discovered two things. I discovered that people really enjoy sharing. They love to uh, help out if they can. And I discovered that if we share things, then basically whatever, there, there's plenty of stuff around us. We don't need anything. Uh, uh, we don't need any, any more stuff. Every, we, we, we live in a world of abundance. So uh, I found a, a, a group of people around me that shared that vision, and together we tried to, to build upon that vision and build a company. And the, the first thing that we built was, a, was a, a sharing platform, a borrowing platform. So if you needed something, you'd post a request, we'd send that out to neighbors. Um, those neighbors can respond with a, with a single click. And when you get an offer you like, you open a chat, and uh, you arrange uh, to meet up, and uh, there you go. You borrow something for free. Uh, this is the platform that's active in, uh, in many cities uh, across the world now most active in the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, and some cities in the United States. Mm. That was in, in 2012. But in 2015, we introduced uh, a new platform alongside the free borrowing platform, a platform that was based on renting. So um, not maybe, maybe, maybe no longer the, the true sharing that some, uh, some activists uh, uh, like to think about of, 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 of a free type of sharing. Um, I think we've, uh, we've accomplished quite, uh, quite some things in the past few years. We managed to raise 2 million euros from, uh, from our community. They're now the biggest investor in our, uh, in our, in our company. We, according to the New York Times, we're the, we're the world leader in this, this space of real sharing. Um, but that doesn't mean that we, uh, we aren't facing, uh, facing struggles, so I'll take you through some of those. I think the, the biggest challenge with building a, a marketplace is, uh, that, that you, is, is that it's very, very hard. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, I think 9 out of 10 uh, startups fail. I wouldn't be surprised if 99.5 out of uh, all 100 marketplace startups fail. 
because you're not just building a single company that has a single product with a, with a single customer. You're actually building two different products for two different customers, and, and, th and these products also have to somewhere, somehow meet in the middle and offer value to both. And that is without even adding purpose. Because if you're adding purpose, it's like building a, a three-sided marketplace. Uh, some people say that building a company is like raising a, raising a child. Uh, and they say that building a marketplace is like raising twins. Well, I would say that building a purpose-driven marketplace is like raising triplets on a gluten-free diet with homeschooling. <laughs> so, um, the way we, uh, um, uh, we, we solved some of, the, uh, some of the marketplace issues at first is, you know, we, the first, the borrowing platform was, we started very purpose-driven. We had this assumption, this idea about it, how it should be. Um, the second time, we started over. And instead of, uh, of, of basically working from, from our vision, we worked with our customers. And uh, whenever, uh, 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 instead of building a lot of technology, the first version of the rental platform was just a, a form online. People could order something. And when they ordered something, we would get an email, we'd hop onto a bike, go to the nearest store, buy the item, and deliver it to them. Um, so that we could talk to these people and figure out why were they uh, ordering something, why did they need something. It wasn't until later that we started combining the other side, that we started to look for, for, the, for the supplier. Um, and I think that's uh, another uh, big struggle. Like if you look at these uh, worker cooperatives, then uh, most of them start from the supply. They start from a base of people that want to work together uh, in a cooperative and offer their services. But what we discovered, and I think what many marketplaces are discovering, is that demand is actually the hardest part of the marketplace. Uh, imagine you're, you're running a, a food delivery startup. If you're able to, to get orders, then I'm pretty sure you'll find a restaurant that's willing to, uh, to sign up with your service to get that extra business. But if you sign up a restaurant, nobody's going to guarantee that you're going to get orders. Um, the, the, when, when we started, people told me nobody is going to want to supply their stuff. Nobody wants to share. Nobody likes to do that. This was 2011. And uh, you, you're going to need to pay people, otherwise they're not going to give you any stuff. Looking back, they couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, this is the, uh, some of the activity over, over a given period of, uh, of time on our, uh, on our sharing platform. As you can see, the amount of activity on the supply side by far trumps demand. So if you want to feel good about humanity, then, then, then give it a try. Post a, a request on Peerby, and you'll see that if you're in an active city like Amsterdam or like San Francisco, you'll probably get 20 offers. People love to share. That's not the problem. Um, what is, though, is that the primary drivers for the demand side of a, of, a, of a sharing economy marketplace, according to many surveys, are convenience, quality, and price. And as you can hear, uh, um, e uh, uh, fairness or, or true sharing are not in, the, in that top three. They're not even in the top five. Um, so it's no surprise that research, pre preliminary research by Stanford is showing that these uh, value-driven marketplaces, these value-driven platforms, grow much slower than transaction-based ones and convenience-based ones. And actually, they also tend to, to stay smaller. So w why is that? What we, what we noticed with our free platform is that, well, we got one thing right, the price, right? No better price than free. Um, but no, no, not much convenience and not much quality. We couldn't guarantee that because uh, there was no, uh, no, 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 vo no money offered for the, for the transaction. So when we built our, uh, our rental platform, we took a big leap. We, uh, we increased the price. And with that, we could also increase the convenience and we could increase the quality, uh, which made it easier for the demand side to use, uh, use our platform. Uh, but not only did it do that, it added a possibility for us to advertise. Suddenly, instead of having to depend on word of mouth and, and, and community and people spreading the message, um, we, could, we could acquire customers. And I'm sorry to say, that is a very effective method of spreading uh, a message. Within a couple of months, we had more transactions on our paid 
marketplace than we had uh, after four years uh, in, on, the, on the free one in the, in the city of Amsterdam. And this, this made me realize something. Um, I, was, I was talking to uh, one of the, uh, the earliest investors in Uber a few weeks ago, and he, he, he invested in Uber when it was only a couple million uh, in, uh, in valuation. And he told me, the strongest business models with the most funding always win. And I was trying to, to wonder why, whether he was right. And um, I'm afraid he might be, because most of these platforms, the platforms that grow exponentially, that grow this quickly, they ac acquire their customers. They have a lot of money for marketing. They spend probably 80% of their budget on acquiring new customers. And in order to do that, you need a strong business model. You, you need to make a lot of money on every transaction. Um, and so the more money you give away to, your, uh, to, the, to the participants in your platform, the less money is left to acquire these customers. Um, so, well, if you don't make money from the business model, then maybe you can raise money in funding, right? But it turns out that most investors like strong business models because they want to make a return on investment. So if you look at the, the companies that make the most money, oh, and if you wonder how you spell sharing economy in Dutch, then it's in the, in the black bubble. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, So it's, it's, the, it's really the, the big companies that are able to grow this, these sharing platforms the quickest. And this is a big struggle. This is, this is reality catching up with, uh, with an idealistic founder like me. Um, so is it really, is it totally impossible to build you know, something is it to, that is about true sharing, that is about having the, the, the participants of the platform owning the platform. It's something we set out to, to discover. And um, a few months ago, we, uh, we invited our, our community over in, in small groups to our, to our office, and we tried to, to find out with them what would they be willing to invest in. Would they, what did they care about? What, what was their passion? What was their purpose? What, was the, what were the, the rational reasons for them to invest? And it turned out they had, actually they, they were both purpose-driven and money-driven. So the reason for them to invest, the reason to decide was the impact, was the social impact and the, and the environmental impact. Um, but the, the, rational, uh, the way to rationalize it for them was that there would be a return on investment. Uh, so that's what we tried to, to create, a story that, uh, that, was, that is balanced. Uh, that is both about creating a successful business and about generating impact on a social and an environmental level. And this story uh, seemed to really resonate with our, uh, with our community. On the, on the top left, you see that the, in, the, in the orange line, you see the normal timeline of a, of a crowdfunding. So normally there's like a little, little steepness in the start, and then it kind of flattens off, and then it, towards the end, uh, it, it speeds up again. What you see here uh, is... Day, the, is day one when we uh, opened up the crowdfunding campaign, and then day two, day three, day no, sorry, day one, day two, day three, day four, and that's when we reached uh, the upper limit of our of our crowdfunding funding campaign. So two million uh, euros uh, raced through our community in uh, in four days, um, and I'm really happy to say that uh, really the majority of that money does come from our uh, from our community. So. I think the, the, the reality of, of building a, a sharing platform is, is that you're, you need both. You need to, to create that return on investment in order to make the marketplace work, in order to really have an impact, to really grow and really reach people. Um, but in the end, what makes me tick and what makes everybody tick, I think, is purpose and is uh, uh, the, the, the need for us to live uh, a happy life in a, in, a, in a great world. So, thank you. <laughs>